<laughs> Hi, Veronica. Hello, Benny. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, how are you today? I'm doing well myself. It's not too bad for a Thursday and then tomorrow's Friday, even though today's April Fool's Day. <laughs> yep. Yep. And uh, I felt that a little bit today. I did. Um, so, Veronica, tell us about you. I am a very interesting person. I, I am somebody who tends to be a contradiction. Um, so one thing about me is is uh, a lot of people up front will see like a bubbly persona. They'll hear my voice. They say, oh, you know, she's, she's real sweet. And then I can be someone who will kind of take you into left field because I'll be into stuff like sci-fi and into scary movies and different things like that. So me as a person, I'm I'm pretty much a contrast. Like you never know what you're going to get sometimes. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of people expect Disney out of me, but I tend to be more of like, let's see what happens with the sci-fi and the aliens come. (laughs) Uh But for me, I guess that's personally. Um, Professionally, I am in the instructional design field. Um, So I work under learning and development and I do work to enhance training experience for different people. Um, My goal is to always be able to help people bridge gaps to where they currently are and where they want to be. Um, It doesn't matter where where, um, they feel stuck, I can help them bridge the gap over to get to where where they want to be with their skill sets. Very cool. And um, you're talking about that Disney thing. I was thinking people are expecting (laughs) Disney and you're you're giving them DC because DC is pretty dark. Yes. In fact, I just watched I watched a commercial for the new Suicide Squad. It was like a extended trailer and I was watching it and I was like, why would anyone want to watch this? Like and my husband's like, yeah, that looks really good. I'm like, yeah, I knew yeah, I knew you would want to watch it. I'm like, don't watch it when I'm in the house. This is this is too dark for me. So, uh, but anyways, <laughs> Uh, so what would you say, what are some of your biggest accomplishments in life and in work? What would you say? In life, honestly, just being alive. Um, that's something that I think every day we know we wake up and we jump into the routine of it. Um, but I guess with the pandemic, maybe it's making me focus on it a little bit more and to be more grateful for it. Um, also for my family, I feel like I have really strong relationships with my family and my friends as well. Um, so they are people that I don't think I could make it in life if if I didn't have them. Um, They're the ones that keep me sane or, you know, sometimes they drive me insane, but uh, Mm -hmm. whose Mm -hmm. family and friends don't do that for them. Um, But professionally, um, I recently got an instructional design job, so I was really happy about that. I uh, was previously a training administrator for a bank, and uh, unfortunately I had to um, have my job eliminated due to the the setback of everything with their budgeting and and kind of what they had outlined for the the bank management. Um, so I ended up taking like a floor level job in doing loan processing, um, which for me, I, I didn't mind doing that to where I can uh, be able to still have a job and benefits and everything. But mm-hmm. it was a little bit awkward because I designed all their training. So everybody in the department <laughs> was kind of like, uh, I don't know if I should train you or not because you wrote the training stuff. And I'm like, no. Mm just go through it. I'll still listen. (laughs) But what was interesting about it is it allowed me to be the learner again. And I think sometimes when you develop training, um, if you don't sit through your own training, you don't really get to see the full aspect of it. You just see an eagle eye before when it's designed and the impact that you want it to have. But when you have to go through your own training as the actual learner, then you're like, ah, let me, mm-hmm. you know, see the true test of, of what was previously designed. And that's why I was able to gauge more of an impact and insight on on what I designed well and maybe some learning curves that I had as well. Yeah. So I'm going to take that last question and kind of twist it a little bit. What would others say about you as far as what would they say are your biggest accomplishments? What would others say? <sighs> That's a hard one. It depends on who you ask. Like, who are these others? Mm-hmm. Um, if they're if they're from the bank, like I knew them professionally, um, they would they would speak highly of me. They'll say I'm a hard worker. They will say that I'm very resourceful and that I'm also very intelligent. Um, if it's like my family, of course they're gonna roast me. They're gonna be like, oh, I don't know about this one. Be careful with her. <laughs> um, you know, and and. They'll, they'll be more um, jovial about it in a sense that they're they're going to be 
thinking of me as like someone who who uh, impacts others, maybe just not in the way that they're thinking. Like I'll come home and be like, you know, this person gave me a compliment. And they're like, did they really? Or are you you paying them to say that? And I'm like, I'm not paying them to say that. <laughs> so I guess it depends on who you ask. But but most people that I work with, um, they do tend to speak well of me. Um, my family, of course, at the end of the day, they do love me. So they'll also speak well of me, too. All right. So so what has your experience been with imposter syndrome? For me, it's more of a haunting. Like, it's been something that's there. And it has as much power that you give it. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that I see and I recognize and you target to diminish it, it it won't be a huge issue. But if you ignore it and you don't think it's there, it's just going to get louder and louder. And then that's where you kind of find yourself in the pitfall of it and having to deal with it, where that anxiety gets real high and you kind of dig yourself in a hole. Um, But yeah, it's been something that's always been there ever since my childhood, honestly. It was something that I used to think I was alone in, but it's very common. It's mm-hmm. I think it's like 70% of people have it. Um, and, and the hard part about it is it's not something psychologists deem as a true diagnosis. They don't um, have it credited under their list. But that doesn't mean that people don't experience it. That doesn't mean mm-hmm. that it's not real. And there's going to be people that say, oh, it's not real. It's just a feeling. It's just, you know, because I'm in that millennial generation where they say, oh, you guys, you just need a trophy for everything. And I'm like, well, it's not about trophy at all. Like, <laughs> it's about, you know, having this feeling and understanding where it comes from. Um, and there's this quote that says, um, a hysterical reaction is historical. And the minute that I heard that, I started understanding, oh, there's a history behind this. There's a reason that I feel what I feel it's valid and you just have to look back and figure out what triggered it and then overcome it the next time. That's very wise for your young millennial self. <laughs> I'll go eat my <laughs> avocado toast now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love avocado toast and I'm not in that Me generation. Too. So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I tried it the other day and I was like, oh, I see what they mean. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what we're talking about. Um, so you you mentioned it, it goes back to your childhood. Do you can you tell us about your first encounter with imposter syndrome or or even if it's just the first time you realized that that's what was happening? Yes. So for my age, when I was younger, I was very tall. I didn't look my age. And, you know, anybody that's been in elementary education, you judge the kids by the size of their height. You're like, oh, that's a ninth grader because a little bit taller. Um, you know, that person's nine years old. They're this height. So when I'm in first grade, I, I look like I should be in third grade. Just the height of, of myself, I was just always very tall. And um, because I was also very literate, I came from a family that reads my mom's an avid reader. She taught me and my sisters to be an avid reader. Uh, my sister's um, also 10 years older than me. So when she was reading to me, she would read high level books. So books she was reading, I was learning how to read some of those things. So when you come into first grade, and you know, this is back in the, the early 80s, I mean, the late 80s, um, they didn't have a requirement to where in first grade you had to take kinder. So when you're entering first grade, you're you're learning your letters, you're learning your alphabet. And as somebody who could read sentences, I was like, you don't know this letter? Very frustrated. Uh-huh. And then I remember we were in the hallway and I got lost. I lost my class when we were um, on our restroom break. And the teacher was like, oh, no, you have to go here. And she sent me to the portable and it was for third grade. And they were reading and I they had a reading time. So I just sat down and I started reading books because it was what I wanted to do. And the teacher, I guess, just didn't notice at that time that there was an extra kid in there. Um, and then when she did, she was like, oh, let's find out where you belong. And she kept checking with the other third grade teachers. And they were like, no, we don't have her. And then, you know, I was like, no, I'm actually with this teacher. And she's like a first grade teacher. So she takes me back over there. And my first grade teacher... I, I think she was like, you can keep her because she was all, oh, yeah, I was wondering where she went. <laughs> and I was like, wow. as a teacher, wow. you know, I'm like, wow, you didn't wonder too long. But for her, she was more of like in the mindset that I was a nuisance for her because I was acting up. 
So anytime that you have a kid that is advanced, if you don't give them something challenging, they're going to become a behavior problem. So I think that's why she had that mindset then, which now having been a teacher, I'm like, that was very dangerous of her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So early on, I had that feeling that I didn't belong, um, that I was going to like, it was a fraudster feeling because it, it was, I got caught. I got caught sneaking into a classroom wanting to read books. Um, and then kind of wondering, like, when is that feeling going to be happening again? Um, later on, as I was in first grade, I would get frustrated with them because I'm like, this says cat, this says dog. <laughs> and I think that's where early on I, I developed those teaching qualities because it was like, wow, these kids really don't know it. And I was I, I was the same age. So I didn't understand. I thought these were opportunities everybody had. Mm-hmm. So when you when you when I met other kids that didn't even know their letters, I'm like, come on, you know, because I'm, I'm not thinking anything different. I'm thinking they had the same thing. Yeah. Do you still struggle with imposter syndrome? I do. I do. Yeah. Um, sometimes. I think it, imposter syndrome, a lot of people believe it's something that when somebody gets it, they don't want to do anything, that they are just going to lay in bed all day and recover. Um, but when you're high functioning, like myself, you just throw yourself in more projects. And I don't know if it's to cover up the void of what I felt that I couldn't do. So I add on more projects to balance out and say, well, I could do this side of it, just not this side. Um, And the hard part is when you're an overachiever, you start to find different things that you're excelling in. And so it makes you take on more and it makes you take on more. But eventually you're going to come across stuff that you don't excel in right away. And when that happens, it kind of sends you into the spiral because then it feels like, well, I couldn't do this one thing, so therefore I can't do nine other things. But that's not true at all because you were doing Mm -hmm. perfectly fine. It was just one of the nine. So it's very interesting contrast. Um, I do tend to find people that have imposter syndrome have the same thing. They have a ton of projects on their plate. Um, And even though they struggle with one thing, that feeling creeps into the other projects because it's a little bit of doubt that carries over. It's that, you know, mindset where if it happened here, it's going to happen again. When was your most recent imposter syndrome episode? Well, I guess we need to find episode. Because honestly, I get this feeling multiple times a week. (laughs) But a full on episode to Mm -hmm. where I was really like, mm, like reactive towards it, I would have to say in December, I took a course, a very advanced course, and I even knew going in, this course is going to be advanced. And if I take it, it's going to end up in one of two ways. Either one, I'm going to learn it and feel like a champion because I did it, or two, I'm going to completely hit the wall. But I knew I knew this going in. I still did it anyways because I hate walking away from opportunities. Because of it being 50-50, mm-hmm. I was like, it could be like the first one. Let's go for it. And even if it is like the second one, the second outcome where I feel like I'm going to fall flat on my face, at least I tried. Um, And then walking away to see it as an opportunity to know where I need to go. Where did I fall? Where where do I need to be? And how much is it going to take to get there? Well, of course, I hit the wall. (laughs) It was to uh, learn storyline and build games. Uh, And I hadn't even like taking the storyline for the first time. I just was like, let me take this gamification class and be able to get through it. Um, And I'm very um, heavy on my ideation skills. I can brainstorm like no other person. I see so many possibilities sometimes, but that's almost um, um, hard because I can't narrow down topics. And so of course Mm -hmm. the same thing happened with my game. And, you know, I, I'm very like, um, I'm, Somebody that uses humor a lot. So I'm like, oh, I'm just going to build an arcade. (laughs) Haha, you know, I'll have multiple games for you guys. But it was because I I couldn't figure out the mechanics of it. I couldn't figure out the game mechanics of it. I had to learn the program and I wanted it to be really good. Um, Of course, it starts getting later into the class where you start seeing other people's samples and then you're like, whoa, I'm not even near 
that that place and it's the holidays and there's so much already to consider so it all stacked up on me and, and that was the last episode that I can honestly say that I was like woo I, I may have bit off more than I could chew <laughs> so so when you were having those feelings when you were realizing that you were kind of in over your head because, you know, you had chosen advanced class and you still need to take the beginner class type of thing. Like what emotions did you feel? What, like, how did you feel physically? Were there anything specific that you can recall? What did it feel like? Um, like physically, I remember it more emotionally now, but I guess physically mm-hmm. it would be, ha- I would have tired eyes. My eyes get real tired. Um, but that's the most that I can think of headaches maybe, but it's more emotional mm-hmm. based than, than physical. Like I don't, I'm not one to stay in bed and dwell on it. It's more of like, I, I just won't do that project right now. <laughs> I'll go do this. Yeah. <laughs> like I replace it with something else to, to keep my mind off of it. <laughs> So what emotions do you think you were feeling? Um, definitely doubt, a lot of doubt, anxiety, um, regret. You know, I, I, I think what's mm. hard sometimes is I knew, I knew this could happen. And so then I started blaming myself because I'm like, I know this is going to happen. I don't know why I did this to myself. So it becomes more um, like regret. Mm-hmm. making that decision but then it, I'm always at war with myself at the same time because I'm like I have to do it I have to feel this type of challenge because then I won't know how to overcome it so I either do it now where I'm in a space that I am in a class and I can learn how to cope with it or I do it while I'm on the job and I don't know about you guys but I'd rather do it while I'm in a class <laughs> so at least I can have more grace than if I were on a job because what if this happened on a project you know and that's something that I do think about you know if I don't if I'm not aware that this can happen and I'm not taking these the first initiative to make sure that I can recover from it and and I guess that's why I'm not somebody that I guess gets physically sick from it because I'm like I can't I have to Mm -hmm. be professional I have to make sure I go I still went to the classes I still you know would turn in assignments um so it wasn't like anything wasn't done it just wasn't the quality that I I would like for it to be and and that's where I was real hard on myself more of the Mm -hmm. perfectionist type (laughs) yeah so when the when this happens how do you cope do you do you have some techniques that you put into place or, or, or what, what makes it better when this happens? For me, um, always focus on what you can do. When you come across something that you can't do, um, it, it, it's, it's nice to keep at it and keep going. But sometimes you need to take a break and just hit pause and say, I'm going to come back to this and I'm going to focus on what I can actually do. And um, I think With doing that, you train your brain to understand that what it feels like to have that success again. Because if you don't remind yourself, you're just going to be focused on what you can't do. You're Mm going to train your brain to have that mindset all the time. And that's where you're going to become one of those people like an Eeyore, like uh, with Winnie the Pooh, where he was always sad and nothing was ever good. Um, I don't want that for myself. So I tend to to hit pause and say, you know, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to come back on this. Um, and I do weigh my odds odds a lot. I say, what's going to happen if I hit pause on this is, is, you know, anybody going to cry and be upset with me? No, it was a class that I I chose to take. Um, and, and that's where, you know, I think ahead and I say, well, on a project, I can't do that. I can't hit pause because the client's waiting. Um, but that's where you start to think of what your uppers are. For me, I found out I am a stress cleaner. I don't know why, but I nerd out on watching um, this car detailing guy on YouTube. Something about watching his videos and him clean the car. And he shows all these little brushes that he uses to get in there. I don't know. It's the most like relaxing thing. I will watch that every night when I go to bed. Um, I also watch um, another lady on YouTube um, where she does 
uh, makeup and she talks about true crime stories. And I just hear is her in the ba- morning. Is it Bailey Syrian? Yes, I, I love, love her. her. She's, she's so just cool. funny. Yes, and then she tells you make good choices, and you're like, mm-hmm. "Yep, I'm gonna make good choices today." So that tends to be like my morning. Um, I play a lot of music, so I think always having the ability to gravitate towards what your uppers are is gonna be very, very helpful. Yeah. What would you share with someone who is experiencing imposter syndrome right now? What would you say to them? Um, I would say that you'll get through it. Um, you know, try again. Think about what it is that's stressing you out. Um, and, and I think for everybody, it's different. They're going to manifest certain consequences of of things that can happen when they can't get through it. Um, you know, I see other people do it all the time. And they manifest things in a way that they say things that may happen, not that they will happen. And and just remember that. Write it down. A blank piece of paper is your best friend because that's where you can say, okay, here's the issue I'm having. And you just draw out little branches and come up with solutions as to how to overcome it. I did that with the game. I said, okay, what's the problem that I'm having with the game? I don't know what triggers are in storyline. <laughs> I don't know what variables are in storyline. Um, and then the other side of it was the game mechanics. And I said, I can't decide on a theme. Um, and then the second one was I can't decide what interaction to use in the game for storyline. And once I branched it out, I looked at one thing at a time. So it's a divide and conquer type of method. Um, so th- that's what I would recommend is, is just know you're going to get through it. Grab a blank sheet of paper and then try to divide and conquer what it is that you're feeling or things that you you are looking at and saying this this is going to happen and this is wrong. Very cool. And I have one more question for you. Mm-hmm. And that last question is why did you want to be part of this imposter uh, part of this imposter syndrome project? What made you say yes, pick me? Um I think it needs awareness. I I don't want it to be a stigma for people. I think a lot of people are met with such, um, I guess, uh, stress in a sense that they can't vocalize that they have it because they don't want to feel like they're they're uh, labeled as somebody that is less than. And you're not. Everybody has it. Everybody just has a different level and a different degree of it. Um, if you know, you really look and you look uh, at movies and you listen to songs. There's a lot of imposter syndrome hidden in there. Um, mm-hmm. One movie in there uh, that I, I think of all the time, because um, I'm like, that's definitely imposter syndrome, is Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Great movie. I don't know if you've heard of this one. <laughs> Amazing movie. She, Fantastic. She literally was faking it and her job because she was 16 and she applies to be a fashion designer and she ends up getting it. And then she's freaking out the whole time trying to play the part and you discover like, what she feels and she's going to get, you know, caught and all this stuff and what happens. And it, it's a very lighthearted movie, but that's just a random, like, early 90s movie with Christina Applegate. And there it is, imposter syndrome. She's you freaking know, out the whole time. I love this example because at first she really is an imposter. And when she is an imposter, she doesn't have imposter syndrome because she's an imposter. Exactly. But once she actually starts to do well at the job and starts to realize that she does know what she's doing, even if she is only 17, I think she's 17, but anyways, either way, um, uh, that's when she starts to start worrying that she's going to get found out and seen as a fraud, which she technically is because she lied about her age, <laughs> but yeah. she does know what she's talking about. So that's a great example. Um, I love that you brought that up. And my favorite was like, because she had a hater at work. I forgot her name. And the hater the whole time is trying to sabotage her. And uh-huh. it just made her skills come out even more. So I guess when you when you have imposter syndrome and you feel like everybody's looking at you and maybe you have one person in your life that they just always point out all your flaws, you know, listen to what they say. 
you know, say, oh, okay, that's that's free feedback that you're going to, you're going to get. And whatever they say, just work on it. And, and that way they can't say that the next time. And then there you go. They're just making your project stronger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're so, we're so glad that you did decide to share your story and thank you for being vulnerable and doing that. And, um, and we appreciate it. So thank you, Veronica, Selena Dominguez. <laughs> thank you, Betty. I appreciate it too. <laughs> If you like this series and you want to show support, go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash If You Ask Betty to learn more about how you can support this and future If You Ask Betty projects. 